<laughs> well, I must say, I'm rather disappointed in you all. Why? Um, it seems that this so-called Valentine's Day went by, and remember last year, I told, last month, I told you, it's really Singles Awareness Day, <laughs> and really what's supposed to happen is all you people who are in relationships, you're supposed to shower your single friends with gifts. <laughs> no? Saving <laughs> land? No. No? no. Not even a Whitman sampler. <laughs> You're going to have to come on. Come, get a little better next year. Thursday was difficult for me, Valentine's Day. I sat by the phone all day long waiting for an invitation, and it never rang. So I just sat at home, made my Swanson pot pie all by myself, while all of the rest of you were out having dinner and roses. Uh, you feeling guilty yet? No. no? Well, if you are, I, I do take checks. You can remove yourself. But please know, I am joking. I do absolutely cherish my single, my singleness. I see it as a blessing. I see it myself as a solitary person called right now at this point in my life to, uh, to a solitary life. And, and that's, that's the way it is for me. That's my the way that I am supposed to be right now. But our culture places so much emphasis on a so, certain so-called right way to be. And we, our culture dishes out ideals all the time. And if you don't fit into that ideal, it's easy to feel diminished. And, that, and there's just so many examples. Just look at how uh, people are pictured in advertising and TV and the movies. And according to that standard, if you really want to be happy, you're a white heterosexual couple with two kids, a dog, and two SUVs in the driveway. And a $500,000 house. And, and you're, you're using pine saw and you're happy about it. Singleness is just one state of being. It's just like being short or being tall or being young, or being old, or being gay, or being straight, or being transgender, or being in a relationship. They're all states of being. And there is no intrinsic rightness or wrongness to any of them. They just simply are. But on the other hand, each state of being comes with it, comes with a certain set of characteristics, and those characteristics can have advantages or disadvantages. They can either be used as a benefit, or they can either be a benefit or a detriment. For example, being tall means you can reach things at the top, uh, top shelf. It also means that when you're in the store, a little short person comes by, you have to reach stuff to them. It all the time. And being single, you know, it has its advantages. It means you have the entire bed to yourself, except the half that's taken up by the dog. <laughs> But it also means you have to take the trash out every single time. Yes. But I'm not jealous. So there's a certain amount of privilege that comes with every state of being. Mm -hmm. Privilege. It comes with every, every single one of us has privilege. You could also use the word power. We all have a certain amount of power in our life. And if we just stop there, it would be great, because everybody would have a piece of the privileged pie, and we could all enjoy the benefits. But then along comes this Jesus guy, and he just messes it all up. He changes it all up. Today, our reading from Luke is Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And the familiar version, blessed, be, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed blah, 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 is found in Matthew. Now, Luke uses much of much of Matthew's version, but pairs it down considerably. Now in the passage just prior to this that we read earlier in Luke 6, Jesus was up on the mountain and he selects his 12 apostles. And then he comes down from the mountain along with them and he delivers the speech on a level place, as opposed to Matthew where it's presented on the mountain. And he's surrounded by a great crowd that have come from all over to hear him and to be healed by him. That's important. The context of this speech is healing. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him, and he 
healed all of them. So this isn't just a speech. This is a healing event. And not only is he healing people of their physical diseases, as he goes into what comes next, he heals us of our social disease. This isn't a great, a curious crowd of onlookers. It's a multitude that came specifically to hear him, specifically to touch him, and to be healed of whatever was going on. So word has spread, and he's now gaining a following. And so this is his first, according to Luke, this is his first real teaching. And so it's Jesus 101. It's the starting point of everything that he had to say. And so it's important. Not only is it important, it's downright revolutionary. It was scandalous. It was scandalous at the time, and it's scandalous today. Scandalous, well, that's a big word. Yeah, and so blessed be, and woe be, and yeah, what's the big deal? Jesus is turning everything upside down. Amen. He's reversing everything. He's turning it all on its head. Jesus associated with the outcasts of this day, and he pronounces God's blessing on them. Not God's curse, but God's blessing on the people that everyone else overlooks and pushes out to the margin. Jesus goes to them, and he blesses them. It's just a nice word. He pronounces God's blessing on them. And so we are right here in our day and age discovering what God is actually, still discovering what God started back then. God is showing us that God has a preference for the poor and the outcasts. And Jesus is telling us and demonstrating what that preference is like. And so it is absolutely subversive in his day and on, and we're just realizing now how subversive it is today, too. So he gives four blessings. <coughs> Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. And blessed are you when people hate, exclude, revile, and defame you on my account. So let's take just a little closer look at each one of those blessings. The first one sounds familiar to us. Blessed are are you who are poor, because it's the beginning uh, for Matthew. But Matthew spiritualizes this blessing. Matthew adds a little tag on the end. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Jesus gets down to the nitty gritty. If you ain't got no money, you're blessed. It's not about, oh, maybe you're, you're feeling sad. Matthew's kind of downplaying it. Jesus and Luke is just getting right to it. Now, this blessing doesn't mean that there's something really great about being poor. It doesn't idealize or glorify poverty. Instead, it points out a universal theme throughout the Jewish and Christian traditions, and that is God's <coughs> prejudicial commitment to the poor. In other words, God's on the side of the poor. And the ever advancing dominion of God moves forward on their behalf. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So what God is doing, advancing that kingdom, advancing that dominion till the point where it all comes back together again, is all for those who have so little or nothing. So one good thing that's coming out of our current political, cultural, ratio, and socioeconomic climate is this distinction, this understanding of that God is there for the poor. The church is just starting, part of the church is just starting to figure that out and get back, hear me, get back to where it needs to be. All right. So we're talking about the haves and the have-nots. Those who are poor and those who are not. And it is the case of the haves who are called to use their privilege, their power, on behalf of the have-nots. And so when having gets in the way of that, 
that's when wealth becomes a problem. When you have wealth and power and you hold on to it for yourself, it gets in the way of you participating in what God is doing. So even wealth in and of, it, of itself isn't a bad thing. Just as being poor isn't a bad thing. What matters is how you use it and what you do with the power that you're given. It's what God expects of us. Blessed are the poor. For those theirs is the kingdom of God. Now the next two blessings are a little different. The first one states where God stands, and the next one demonstrates how God reverses the way things are. First, if you're hungry now, you'll be filled. If you're weeping now, you'll laugh. The emptiness and the despair of today is going to be reversed and erased. Nice thought. But how? How does that happen? How do the hungry get filled? How do the, the weeping turn their weeping into mourning? Well, back in the story of the Exodus, the hungry Israelites were literally fed by bread from heaven in the form of manna and quail. God filled them. God fed them in the wilderness. Well, I don't see manna falling from heaven too often. So then, how does that happen? It happens with those who have the power, the privilege, to feed, to yeah. share, to give. So just as there's four blessings, there's four corresponding woes. Woe to the rich. You've got your consolation. You've got everything you're going to get. And if you're going to hold on to it, that's all you're going to get. Woe to those who are laughing now. One day you'll weep. Woe to those who speak well of you. That really doesn't get you anywhere because they spoke well of the prophets of old and that really didn't get them anywhere except in a whole bunch of trouble. So Jesus states, just as states of being come with privilege, they also come with responsibility. Privilege and power come with responsibility. We see responsibility as a burden often. We see it as something that must be done or has to be done or uh, something difficult, but that's not the way God sees it. God sees this as our state of being. God sees this as just what's expected of us as children of God. If we have and we hold on and we keep and we withhold, then nothing changes. That dominion of God doesn't go any further. It stays where it is, and the power structures of this world stay where they are. And that is not what God wants. If we are to be on the same side of God with the poor, then we, as we give to them, we receive the same blessing that they receive. We receive that kingdom of God. <clears throat> Liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez wrote, God has a preferential love for the poor, not because they're morally necessarily better than others, morally or religiously, but simply because they are poor and living in an inhuman situation that's contrary to God's will. The ultimate basis for the privileged position of the poor is not in the poor themselves, but in God's graciousness and the universality of God's unconditional love. So this is Black History Month, a time when we honor the contributions of African Americans to our, our, our world. And it would be nice for me to say, stand up here and expound on someone, some person from history, and share their contribution of society, and that would be a good thing. It would educate us. It would give me and you information. But is that what we need? Do we need more information? The reason we have to have Black History Month is because black history has been re erased. Yeah. It's been rewritten. It's been ignored. Why? Because of white privilege. I name it. White privilege. My privilege. I'm not going to talk about your privilege. That's your business. My privilege. As a white man, I am part 
of the process and the systems that have dismantled African American history and ignored it and, and written it out of our history. And I have a responsibility for that. <laughs> I have power to use that I have to that I have to choose where it's going to go. And each one of us has to answer that same question. How are we going to use our privilege in order to undo what's been done and to recreate the world into God's image? To be on God's side, to be in right relationship with God, to be a right-like person, to be a righteous person, I have to be on the same side of who God is on. That means I have to be on the side of the poor too. How well are we doing? How are we as a church doing? How are we as a nation doing? How are we as a race, a gender, a sexual orientation? How are we as single people, tall people, short people, young people? How are we doing? How are we using our blessedness? for the blessedness of others. I don't have a definitive answer, but I can say we're not doing as well as we could. We still have a lot more to do. So this chapter today, these blessings and curses call us to answer the question, what can I do, what can we do in order to improve? to work together as the unified body of Christ alive and at work in the world today, a body made up of individual parts yet working at together as a whole. How can we use what we have to reverse the current state of being and make it what God intends it to be? Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, you call us to use our power, to use our being, to use what we have for the blessing of others. The initial blessing you gave so, back, so far back in the Old Testament was given that the entire creation might be blessed. And that blessing is now ours through your Son, Jesus. May your Spirit move through people of faith and goodwill in all times and places that your dominion, your, your life, your God life might be advanced, that all might share in it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.